Hi and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's Top 50 Movies number 4. So this video is a part of a series of videos where I count down my top 50 favorite movies of my lifetime. For my top 10 movies I'm doing a video review for each movie in my top 10 and this video is for my 4th favorite movie of my lifetime. And number 4 is Memento. Uh, Christopher Nolan's second film, but the film that first put him on the map and really got people to notice him and remains to me uh, the best film he's ever made. Um, I'm afraid uh, because of the nature of this film, the spoiler free section of this video won't be very long because it's hard to talk about this movie without getting into spoilers, but I will try. So if you haven't seen this movie yet, you're safe for now. I'll give you a warning when I'm about to get into spoilers. So Memento is a very unique film as it takes place in reverse order. The very first scene of the film is the last scene to take place uh, chronologically. There are two sets of scenes that switch back and forth from each other, those in color and those in black and white. The scenes in color are the main focus of the film and are the longer scenes. The scenes in color uh, go in reverse order and the scenes in black and white are go in uh, straightforward in chronological order. However, they take place before the color scenes. So the very last scene of the film starts in black and white but turns into color because it catches up uh, to the first um, seen chronologically in color. Uh, it's hard to explain, but if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the black and white scenes are mostly exposition scenes uh, with either voiceover or the main character talking on the phone that's meant to explain his backstory and his motivations. So as you can see, it's a very unique film. I know it's not the only film to play with nonlinear narrative structure, and I don't think it's even the only film to go in reverse order, but it is still incredibly unique. Uh, it makes it really hard to follow at first, but it also makes repeat viewings of the film incredibly enjoyable, but I'll get more into that later. Memento is about a man whose wife was raped and killed in an attack in which he suffered brain damage. As a result of that brain damage, he lost the ability to keep and maintain long-term memories. Um, this method was used in several comedy films for comedic effects such as Clean Slate and Fifty First Dates, uh, but its use of it here is not comedic in the least and in my opinion is the most effective. At any rate, because of the nature of the story, having the scenes go in reverse put the audience in the perspective of the main protagonist, Leonard Shelby, as Leonard, uh, the audience, uh, doesn't know what happened before. Although the audience does eventually gain more knowledge than the protagonist by remembering what came after these events. However, scene by scene, it does a really great job of putting you in the mind of the protagonist because like him, you have no idea how he got there or what came before. So Leonard Shelby isn't an ordinary guy with a memory condition. The film follows him as he's on a mission to kill the man who killed his wife and caused his memory problems. Uh, he keeps a file of police reports and notes that track his progress in finding him. He knows uh, that it is a man that has the first name of John or James and a last name that starts with the letter G. He keeps notes everywhere, even covers his bodies and tattoos uh, that are notes that help him track his progress and remind him on how to live with his condition. The entire film is seen through uh, Leonard's perspective. Uh, as I mentioned, the reverse order puts you in his mindset, but also the film is heavy with voiceovers and narratives that really do a good job of putting you in his mind and you see the world and all the other characters through his eyes. There's amazing performances throughout the film. Guy Pearce and Joe Pantolano were amazing, but the most memorable performance for me was Carrie Ann Moss, uh, who was simply spectacular in this film. I I do believe this was her best performance she ever gave as Natalie as you can never tell what she's up to, what type of person she really is. The soundtrack to the film is very effective in its haunting eeriness, in fact the whole film does a great job of affecting a very eerie and unsettling tone throughout. The film is filled with people of questionable morality and questionable honesty, so you never know who's lying or who's playing straight. Uh, this is a film that really does get um, 
better every time you see it. As soon as you watch it once, you immediately want to watch it again. And the more you watch it, the more you pick up. And those are by far my favorite types of films. The ones that you really want to watch more than once and the ones that really stimulate your mind and really get you thinking about it for years after. Uh, this film in particular, I think, really stimulates the mind and had me pondering over it for many years. I always love film and TV shows that... Uh, you know, where you have a scene that happened uh, prior to the current uh, timeline that makes you look at the current timeline in a whole new perspective. And this film pretty much does that constantly all the way through. Just when you think you have a handle on things, everything gets pulled right out from under you. And it's brilliant. But overall, I was just in awe of how well of what appears to be a big mess the first time you see it fits so perfectly together. Uh, I would describe this movie as the brilliant kind of storytelling that is really unique and hard to find and to me this film is a masterpiece which is why it stands as my number four favorite movie. So now is the time where I get into spoilers uh, of the film so if you have not seen this film please under no circumstances should you proceed any further as this is a film you do not want spoiled. It's uh, something that's much better to see for yourself. So if you haven't seen it go out and watch it and then come back and thanks a lot for watching. But if you have seen it please follow me uh, to the spoiler section. So the brilliance of this film is that every character in the film is an unreliable narrator, most particularly Leonard Shelby himself. However, the other characters like Natalie and Teddy are completely unreliable as well because it's obvious that there are liars and that they lie to manipulate Leonard so it's impossible to know what part of what they say are lies and what part is truth. In fact, some things aren't objectively answered in the film. One can have a theory or a leaning but it will be a matter of perspective. For example, I often wonder whether when Natalie looked up the name of the license plate for Leonard and it ended up leading him to Teddy, whether or not she knew it would lead him to Teddy. To me, it would make sense if she did know because she knew about Teddy and wanted Leonard to um, tell her about him. So I think she could deduce that he was responsible for killing Jimmy. So it's kind of poetic that Teddy used Leonard to kill Jimmy, so Natalie used Leonard to kill Teddy. However, there's nothing to really indicate she knew that the information she gave him would lead him to Teddy. Uh, she stated several times she never met Teddy and wouldn't know what he looked like or anything about him. However, she did say that a cop came into the bar before Leonard did looking for him. One can only assume that this was Teddy, so she would have recognized the picture from his license when she did the background check. Um, I'm not sure how she know how that the license plate belonged to him beforehand. Maybe she'd figured out somehow that Leonard was looking for Teddy. Uh, or maybe it's all just a happy coincidence and she just was helping him to find his wife's killer. It's hard to tell uh, where she stands because you only see her through Leonard's eyes and so you never really know when to trust when she's being honest or not. And then there's Teddy. No matter how many times I've seen this film, I just can't figure him out. I know he was a cop that he knew from all the way back when Leonard was first encountered his memory problems, but I don't understand why Leonard didn't already have a picture of him before uh, they met at that scene that was, well, at the end of the film, but basically happened chronologically towards the beginning of the film. And he was obviously the one Leonard was talking to on the phone and slipping him stuff under the door. So why was he listening to the story about Sammy Jenkins if he's heard it a billion times before? And why was he doing all that shit? Uh, he's someone uh, else who is completely dishonest as he tells Leonard about a cop slipping shit under the door and trying to get him to kill the wrong guy, but really it's him who's doing it. However, the one thing he said that I think is 100% the truth is the story he tells Leonard at the end of the film on how his wife 
did survive the attack and the story he tells himself about Sammy Jenkins and his wife uh, tricking him into giving her too much insulin is actually what happened to Leonard and his wife and that Teddy did already help him find the real John G whom uh, he already killed. The film gives us several hints at this besides Teddy's story and the black and white scenes where Leonard is describing the story of Sammy Jenkins when Sammy is in the institution after his wife was put in a coma you see a very brief flash where it's Leonard who's sitting in the institution. Also has Teddy's telling him the story about how his wife was really the one who uh, had the insulin injections. You get a brief flashback of Leonard injecting her with insulin uh, um, but then uh, it changes to him just pinching her after he says, oh, my wife wasn't a diabetic. To indicate that she really was diabetic, but he was convincing himself she wasn't. And then there's the picture he got of him smiling that Teddy said was after he killed John G. And then as he's driving to the tattoo parlor, a few memories flash on the screen. And one of them, clearly, he's lying in bed with his wife while he's covered in tattoos. So clearly she survived the attack and he had the tattoo on his chest saying I did it so clearly she was still alive after he killed John G so the irony comes in is that throughout the whole film we see Leonard with this picture of Teddy that says don't believe his lies but we find out Leonard wrote that after Teddy told him about his past which actually happens to be the absolute truth so the whole f whole film Teddy is presented as a liar which he clearly is however the one piece of evidence that Leonard and the audience had that he was a liar was actually from Teddy telling Leonard the hard truth that he did not want to hear uh, what I want to know is whatever happened to the money that was in Jimmy's car when Leonard took it I mean Later we find out that's uh, why Teddy's, you know, has been obsessed over Leonard's car. But did he actually get it? Because in one scene we see Teddy sitting in Leonard's car waiting for him. And uh, some cars have a lever that lets you open the trunk. So I wonder if, you know, if he was... If he used that to get the money or perhaps you know it's the kind of trunk that you need a key to open anyway there's a lot of tiny details like that that were never really explained but that's perfectly fine because you're seeing things through Leonard's perspective and since he was never aware of the money in these earlier scenes uh, that is the scenes that take place later chronologically uh, the audience is never aware of it either but what I really like about this film is that there are no likable characters. Everyone in it is a scumbag in some ways. Of course, in some movies this can be a very bad thing, but here it really works. Uh, you have Brett, uh, the sleazy hotel clerk that scams Leonard into paying for two rooms. There's Natalie, who manipulates Leonard into taking care of um, a man sent to kill her. And she even taunts him before doing it. And by the way, that scene was freaking amazing. So well acted. Uh, and then there's Teddy, who's, uh, who's using Leonard in order to rip off drug dealers and otherwise manipulating him to serve his own purposes. But the worst character of all is Leonard himself. Throughout the film, we're meant to sympathize with him. As for one, he's the main character. We see the whole world through his eyes and hear his internal thoughts. And for two, he suffered a, an attack in which his... Uh, wife was killed and he suffered brain damage to the point where his whole life has been ruined so you can really sympathize with him and you root for him to succeed but um that's all taken right out from under you by the ending that reveals that he did kill the attacker that caused him brain damage and his wife wasn't killed in the attack he put his own wife in a coma because of his condition and she couldn't live with it anymore and so she tricked him um and he lied to himself to forget these things and to forget that the fact he had already killed his attacker in order to give his life purpose by hunting down his wife's killer even though he knew at least at some stage that his wife wasn't killed by the attack and the attacker is already dead. So really, this is one fucked up guy. Apparently, uh, Jonathan Nolan uh, wrote a short story about Leonard's time in an institution where he would write himself notes you know, everywhere telling himself he needs to escape and find his wife's killer um, when the doctors uh, try to tell him the truth. And that he eventually escapes the institution and with Teddy's help uh, started going on a kill crazy rampage. At the end of the film, 
Leonard blames Teddy for this and thus decides to set him up to be killed. But really, it wasn't Teddy's fault. Teddy was just taking advantage of the situation. It's Leonard who needs to have this perpetual mission that he never wants to solve of finding his wife's killer, and he doesn't care who he has to kill to do this. This is one fucked up and deranged guy, and arguably he's the biggest villain presented in this film. The film also does an outstanding job of exploring the concept of loss, as um, the last thing Leonard remembers is his wife being attacked, which he has convinced himself caused her death. However, uh, it's always on his mind, and his, he, he's completely consumed by this loss. Not only the loss of his li wife, but the loss of his life as he's completely a different person than he used to be. But what's really interesting is he used this condition to change his reality and his memories of events to make it so he was the victim. So uh, it was someone else who killed his wife and he was a hero off on a righteous mission for revenge when in actuality he is partly responsible for putting his wife in a coma. Although ultimately it wasn't really his fault she manipulated him uh, because she couldn't live with his condition but still that is something that he'd feel guilty over but he it just pretends it doesn't exist and pretends he's some sort of noble crusader when really he's just a psychotic killer who belongs in a mental institution it really speaks to how people in real life who suffer a loss whether it be a death the death of a loved one or a divorce will always paint themselves in the most positive light as the victim, regardless of whether or not that's really the case. For example, people who stalk their ex-girlfriends or put up revenge porn of them on the internet without their permission or do any other sorts of deplorable things because they can't deal with the loss. They all see themselves as the victim and the one who was wronged. At any rate, I felt this was one of the most complex and intricate films ever made and I am in forever in awe of how they managed to pull off something so mind-bending that keeps you satisfied after re repeated viewings and I think it's just brilliant and it's the type of storytelling I would always aspire to making this my fourth favorite film of my lifetime. So that's it for my top 50 movies number 4. Be sure to check out the other videos in my top 50s movie series. I'll put links in the description below for the other movies. And be sure to subscribe to my channel to keep up with my top 3 which will be coming soon. And thanks a lot for watching.